Thank you. I've been asked to do four things in my 45 minutes. First, give folks just a flavor of the trial, what actually happened. Second, run through the main points of the court's ruling. Third, give my personal view on what's going to happen next. And then fourth, answer any questions. And someone's talking. Like that? OK. First, there, I, I have a two-page handout in the back that has a lot of this information on it. The full court ruling, the testimony, there are daily summaries of the testimony, and some charts that I'll be showing. They're all on certain web pages, which are all shown here, as well as in that handout. First thing, with respect to the trial itself, this was a bench trial, which means you don't have a jury. The judge sits there, hears all the witnesses, he determines who's telling the truth, what the truth is, and then what the law requires. This trial lasted from August 31st through October 21st. We had about 30 witnesses testify live. About 30 witnesses submitted their testimony under oath by deposition. The first exhibit, Exhibit 1, fittingly enough, was Article 9, Section 1 of our state constitution. Exhibit two, fittingly enough, was that quote from the Seattle School District opinion 30 years ago that they said constitutional education is more than just reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's the knowledge and skills kids need to compete in today's economy and meaningfully participate in our democracy. And then the exhibits ran on, so the last exhibit was number 1,652. Uh, the case focused on primarily 13 focus districts, which were school districts from around the state that were chosen by both sides to be a fairly representative sample of the state as a whole, the state's own personnel and witnesses, and then the experts that the state paid to fly in from out of state to tell the judge that everything was just fine here in the state of Washington. I would like to give you a, just a flavor of some of the types of testimony and exhibits that came through. First. What is that language of our Constitution that we are arguing about? And this, these, everything we used was from the state's own documents, was, which was sort of nice. It was hard for the state to undercut what we were saying when we were, we were using their own documents. This is from one of their reports. What does the Washington State Constitution say about K-12 public school funding? And then it quotes that paramount duty clause of our Constitution. It's the paramount duty of the state to make ample provision for the education of all children residing within its borders. And the state's own documents, again, go on and say the constitutional provision is unique to Washington. While other states have a constitutional provision related to education, no other state makes K-12 education the paramount duty of the state. Now, we have tried to emphasize throughout our case that, well, even if you don't care about things like democracy, and we had a lot of witnesses talk about how important education is to democracy, if you're just cold, callous dollars and cents, it makes cold, callous, callous dollars and cents sense to amply fund education. We use the state's own documents, like their own budget highlights from the office of the governor that pointed out that you spend $6,200 every year for educating a kid, $28,000 a year to incarcerate them. The state's own studies that, for example, show that with respect to spending money on early learning for kids in low-income families, you get back $2.53 you get back $2.53 for every dollar you put in. And this isn't like to society as a whole. This is state savings. They save $2.53 for every dollar they spend. This is the state's own studies. We then use the state's own studies and own documents that show, for example, the underfunding of actual salaries that the state, that what school districts actually have to pay in the market. And then the difference, that's circled in green, circled in red, the lower numbers that the state actually funds. The state's own documents showing that they underfund maintenance of just buildings. They only cover 58% of facilities maintenance, and the numbers are actually going down. The state wanted to argue, oh, we're trending up, we're doing better, oh, we're doing so much better, but their documents kept showing that, well, no, actually, the trend is going the wrong direction. We emphasize that the state's own documents, that just for the, you know, the NERCs, the material supplies, et cetera, the state's own studies show that they're underfunding it by $585 million a year. The state's own studies showing about how with respect to transportation, you can't see it very well on the slide, but the red line is what the, the diesel costs actually are, and the blue line is what the state assumes they are when they're funding school districts. <laughs> And, and the, where the red line comes from, it's not like a surprise to the state. You know, DO, the State Department of Transportation tracks these numbers you know, for the ferry system. So they've got them. They just don't apply them 
the school districts. The state's own documents showing that transportation underfunding, the gap is widening over time. Again, the trend's not going the right way, it's actually going the wrong way. The state's own documents showing that they fund less than 15% of the facilities costs for school districts. The state's own documents showing that just urgent repair needs in the year 2007-09, actually that biennium, the state calculated that there was $10.4 million in urgent repairs needed so they funded $4 million. Now, we had a whole series of documents, but it ended up being pretty confusing. And I think what was most compelling to the judge is a very simple graphic. And what we did is we said, judge, wipe the table clean. Let's just start. You have a school district. What's the first thing you need? Well, you need school buildings. And, we'll calcu and we calculated the cost from that using the F-196s, which we already had the state auditor's office and the state uh, witnesses saying are accurate, et cetera. And so we had the numbers for school buildings that a school district spends. Classroom teaching, transportation, librarians, counselors, the non-classroom certificated employees, school building administrative staff, principals, et cetera. The minor things like utilities, insurance, you know, stuff like that. Uh, extracurricular activities and food service. You add all those up and that is what a school, act school district actually pays to operate their school every year. And we had we called four witnesses at trial to testify live. The superintendent of Colville, Edmonds, Yakima, and Chimicum. And then the other focus district superintendents all testified via sworn deposition. And they all testified as to what those amounts were. The state then came in with their evidence of what they fund for their basic education funding. And it's about that size. This is what they were saying fully funds everything a school district needs. Now, the state then also came in and said, well, we've got some discretionary funding that we throw in there. There are some federal programs that add some more money. But the fact of the matter was, every single school district in our state uses local dollars just to fill the gap between what they actually spend and what they get from the state. Now, there were some school districts where that number was relatively small because they had big federal uh, funding. Some where it was much larger because they had smaller federal funding. But the fact always remained that local dollars is what was filling the gap. The fact also remained that you know, what school districts actually pay isn't what they actually need. The school district superintendents kept saying, that, look, we are failing our kids. I do triage. I have to decide, am I going to save these 10 kids here and let these five go, or vice versa? They're, they're forced to make Sophie's choices every day because of the lack of funding. The state's witnesses came in and said, oh, everything's fine. You, can, you have all the money you can spend. Uh, you have all the money you need. Uh, and one of the state's arguments was, let's look at your, for example, graduation rates. They, went, they talked to Colville. And they said, look, you graduate 85% of your kids. That's just fantastic, isn't it? I mean, that's so much better than a lot of other districts. That's so much better than schools all across this, the country. Isn't that great? Ken Emo looks at him and goes, the state's attorney goes, you're kidding me. I'm losing 15% of my kids. That's not a success. And the AG kept going, well, but you're doing so much better. That's, you should be proud of yourself. And he goes, that just means my house is burning down slower than other people's houses. That doesn't mean my house isn't burning down. They, the state tried a similar thing with Nick Brossett, the superintendent of Edmonds. And he, they pointed out that with uh, middle income and upper income white kids, they graduate you know, 85% of their kids. That's really great. And Nick said, well, you know, and the, and the state was saying, isn't that a success? And Nick said, well, you know, if I have a field trip and I take 100 kids on the field trip <laughs> and I bring back 85, <laughs> I don't think people are going to call that a success. 